Hello and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video we're going to go through the last section of chapter 2, uh, graphical misrepresentations of data. This will likely be a very short video because there's not too much to talk about here. We're just going to be talking about how data can very easily be manipulated or misrepresent, uh, misrepresented depending on how the graphs are used and some things that you need to keep in mind when creating graphs of your own. Uh, a lot of these will be pretty obvious to tell which one is the better one, but you may not uh, know exactly why, and that's hopefully what we're going to talk about here. Uh, for the first one, the first one is just a simple misrepresent, uh, misrepresented data, and here we have burglaries in Minneapolis. Note that in all these cases, each pair of graphs is supposed to be representing the same information. Uh, the first one we have July to August, we have about 20% of burglaries, and then it says then for other months, 8% for this horizontal bar graph. Then for the vertical bar graph, we have every single month, and we have the percentages given to them with this axis here. Of the two, the bad graph is the first one. Uh, the first one is the bad graph here. Now, the reason it is bad is because it is really misrepresenting the data. It says July to August 20%, and it's pretty easy to tell where it gets that number. If you look at July and August in the other graph, July and August are um, 11 and 9% respectively. So if you add those two together, that gives you 20%. That's probably what happened here, um, that they just added the two together. The 8% though for the other months is a little bit strange and maybe a little bit harder to notice. If you see 8%, 8% is roughly here, which seems to be kind of splitting the middle between the other graphs. Some are higher, so, or the other bars. Some are higher, some are lower. The reason they got 8% for the other months is because that's the average for the other months. So what this graph is actually trying to do is trying to show the sum of both July and August percentage of burglaries and compare that to the average of the other months, which doesn't really make sense. Yes, July and August do have some of the higher percentages of burglaries compared to the rest of the months, but the way that it's represented here, you're actually trying to show two completely different statistics and compare them together. Just like if you were to um, compare a percentage to I don't know, uh, an average, something like that. These are two completely different values and they have nothing to do with each other. And they should not be compared. So that's really what's wrong with this graph, is that it's uh, showing two completely different calculated values but not telling the reader that that happened. I don't know based on these graphs that uh, that issue occurred. Remember, when you're also making graphs, they should be able to stand on itself or on their own. So when I look at that first graph for burglaries, I can be very misled in terms of what's going on. For the second graph, for manipulating the vertical scale, this is going to talk about a very important thing about histograms, or histograms and bar graphs, really. Um, but both of these being for bar graphs. You see highest marginal income tax rate for the first pair of graphs, and they're both vertical bar graphs, and they're both comparing 2012 to 2013. But this first graph makes the bars look a lot taller and they look pretty close to each other, whereas the second graph makes 2012 look like just a fraction of what 2013 is. The bad graph is the second graph here. And the reason is a very important thing about histograms and bar graphs. Histograms and bar graphs always need to start at zero. The lowest value on the frequency or relative frequency or whatever the vertical rate is should always be zero. The reason is because when you're looking at histograms or bar graphs, the way that we mentally read this is by trying to compare the heights of these graphs. I tried to see, okay, how tall is this uh, bar for 2012 compared to how tall the bar is for 2013? Depending on how tall those bars are, and uh, comparatively, I should be able to make conclusions about which one is more prevalent, by how much, how did it compare to the previous values, etc. But when I look at this second graph, that makes 2012 look like maybe a third of what 2013 is, I can come to the incorrect conclusion that there is a 
that 2013 is three times as much as it was in 2012, simply by looking at how tall the bars are. Now, some of you may be saying, well, yeah, but you should be looking at the axis too. But remember that the layman, the person that doesn't work with graphs as much, is just going to have a passing glance at this. And if they don't analyze it too close in depth, it's very easy to be misled by what is shown here. For histograms and bar graphs, you always, always, always start the axis at zero. Always start the vertical axis at zero. That will also tie into the second paragraphs we have here for number and poverty. We have one bar graph for number and poverty, and we also have a line chart for uh, number and, for percent and poverty. And they look like they're representing the same thing, but again, the bar graph is the one that's bad here, because if I look at the lowest value on the vertical axis, it's not starting at zero. This is making a lot of incorrect conclusions. For example, 2008, looks like about half of what 2010 is. So it looks like maybe that the number in poverty has doubled from what it once was in 2008 to what it is in 2010, which is not correct. And even more egregiously from 2013, which is the highest value here, compared to the original 2000 value, it looks like maybe poverty has increased by four or five times maybe which is not what actually has happened. It has increased, yes, and that is something that is completely true, but it has not increased by how much the bars try to associate. If you want to show small changes in percentages or small changes in values over time, a line chart like this is much better, sometimes also called even a time series is much better. If you're trying to show small changes of information, a line chart is better. And also, when you have a line chart, you are allowed to zoom in on the data. It does show here uh, a little break from 0 to 11. You see a little bit of a, a squiggle here after 0. That's saying that some values have been skipped up to 11. But that's fine. For line charts, the whole point is to show minuscule changes and to show how uh, that is progressing over time. It, with the line chart, it's not trying to represent something as doubled. It's just trying to show things have changed. Uh, so it's, it is actually important for line charts for you to zoom in on these small changes of data. Okay, so overall for number two, do never, start, never, never, never start a histogram or bar graph uh, at a number other than zero. Always start them at zero. Lastly, for number three, we have the issues with pie charts that I kind of alluded to in 2.1, how they're very, very easy to manipulate. The general concept in this section is that you do not want to overcomplicate the data. The first graph for soccer participation, I have this graph showing two different soccer balls, one for 91, for one for 2009, and the size is supposed to indicate the participation. And another one, uh, for what we call a pictograph, which is basically a histogram or a bar graph that just uses pictures. Um, most people will obviously tell that the second graph is the better one. Uh, the first graph is the bad one. The reason why the first graph is the bad one, other than the fact that we don't have a legend like the second one does that gives us an idea of what the sizes actually mean numerically, um, the other problem with it is that you're increasing the amount of dimensions that the reader would need to analyze. In the first case, with these uh, balls, what we have is 91. We'd be trying to see how much space fits inside of that ball of 1991 compared to how much stuff fits inside of the space for the ball of 2009. That is an area calculation. It'd be asking you to compare length versus width and, le and length versus width. And you're trying to find the area of this shape, which is a two-dimensional concept. That's a lot harder to do than the second graph, the second uh, table or graph that we have here, where we're simply trying to compare the lengths of these bars or heights if we had it vertical. All we'd be trying to tell is, okay, how long is one bar compared to the other? And that can give us our comparisons. That is only a one dimensional comparison, length, compared to the first graph, which was a two dimensional comparison of area.
Generally, you do not want to increase the dimensions that the reader will need to analyze for your graph. You want to make it simple and readable. That's the main concept. The same also applies for the second paragraphs, which are pie charts, and these pie charts are again representing the same data for educational attainment. Now, never mind the fact that the first pie chart gives us percentages and the second pie chart does not. Even if the pie, uh, neither pie chart gave us percentages, the bad graph is still the second one. This second graph is still the bad one. The reason is, yet again, it's increasing the dimensions that the reader would need to analyze. The first graph is already bad enough because it's a pie chart, and that means that each slice you would need to be comparing area. For high school diploma, I'd be trying to see how much stuff fits inside of that area piece compared to the associate's degree and how much stuff fits inside of that area. That is still a two-dimensional concept, which is more complicated than it needs to be. But with the second graph, it's even worse. The high school diploma back here, this is now a three-dimensional piece. It's a volume. It has a length, it has a width, and also has a height. Now I'm comparing three dimensions, which is even more difficult. And volume, historically, uh, people have a lot of difficulty trying to compare volume of objects. So that's even harder to do. Furthermore, when you make it a three-dimensional graph like this, even though it looks pretty, what you also start to incorporate is the concept of perspective. The, which means that the shapes that are closer to you look larger because they are inherently just closer than the values that are further away. Imagine if somebody walked uh, closer to you. When they're far away, they look very small, but the closer they get to you, the larger they appear. It's all about perspective. What's funnier about this is if you do compare those specific two slices, not a high school graduate, an associate's degree. If I look at the first graph, not a high school graduate is 12%, associate's degree is 10%. So that means that this associate's degree is 10% and this not a high school graduate is 12%. So that actually means that piece in the back that looks so much smaller is actually larger than the one that's way up front. Some may also say, well, you can remedy this by labeling the pie chart and saying that associates is 10%, some uh, college no degree is 17%, high school diploma is 30%. But then that even becomes worse because then that adds a disconnect for the user between what they see and what they read. They're seeing these slices of the pie chart, some that uh, are very much smaller than some of the ones that are closer, but then they also see the percentages, and then there's that disconnect. The percentage of not a high school graduate in the back is 12%, which 12% is smaller than 10%, but the slice of associate's degree is bigger than the slice in the back. So why do those not link up? There's, there's a lot of issues with that. Overall, never ever make a three-dimensional pie chart. Yes, it looks prettier generally, but you're making it more complicated to read and you're very often going to mislead the reader in terms of what they're trying to get. Overall though that covers everything in 2.3 just kind of talking about how you should represent the data. Overall keep in mind that you should be comparing uh, like statistics. So the first graph the issue was that we were not comparing the same statistic. We were adding values compared to the average of them. Uh, for the second paragraphs, the main takeaway is that histograms and bar graphs should always start at zero. And for the third op, uh, the third paragraphs that we had here, the main takeaway is that you do not want to increase dimensions if you don't have to. Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be for the reader. You want to make sure that they can see the graph, they can read it, they can understand it, and move on. They don't want to. You don't want them to spend a while to try to consider try to consider things or try to analyze things from the graph itself. You want to present the data and you want to present it clearly. But with that said, that's everything that I want to talk about in 2.3. With that said, you should be able to complete everything in 2.3 and in all of chapter 2 itself. Um, but with that said, I hope you have a great day.